I'd like to address three things in turn. The production of coins, the context of coin finds, and the modern recovery study and care of coins, all with an eye towards the challenges posed by large quantities of coins found in shipwrecks. Coins first appeared in the, modern, or in the Western world some 2,700 years ago. During most of this very long history, coins were entirely handmade. The metals were excavated and smelted by hand, the coin blanks were manufactured by hand, the dyes were engraved by hand, and the coins were struck by hand. Oops. Their use as monetary instruments required that coins be standardized, but because coins were handmade, each individual coin differed in some ways from all others produced at roughly the same time. The alloys would differ from batch to batch, individual weights within a single batch would vary, dyes would wear and be recut, or different obverse and reverse combinations might be used. Of the billions of handmade coins produced over the centuries, only a very small proportion of them remain today. This means that the detailed study of every existing coin helps us to piece together the bigger picture of a state's fiscal and monetary policies particularly the decisions made about how many coins to strike in a given year, in which denominations, and in which alloys. Detailed study helps us to understand how mints operated as both government institutions and factories, how they developed organizational structures and production processes to meet the demands. Various parts of this process were mechanized in some mints, but not universally so, starting in the 17th century meaning um, that individual coins within a series dating from the 19th century, for example, might differ in some ways from other coins within the same series, sometimes quite significantly. In fact, it is really only for coins struck in the 20th century when the production process became fully automated and machine tolerances became amazingly precise that we can truly begin to speak of coins within a series being virtually indistinguishable from another. For earlier periods, the singularity of each and every coin matters for helping to piece together the economic, social, and political histories of those who made and used the coins. This is true even where textual evidence like mint records exist, since these are often incomplete, have errors, or purposely don't tell the whole story. Now, most of what we know about how coins were used comes from where coins were found. While single coins are often found where they were dropped, most historic coins come from hoards, which represent the deliberate decisions to select particular types of coins and gather them together in one place, whether this was for safekeeping, for transport, for religious purposes, or whatever. The careful study of a single hoard can reveal how and why it was assembled. By comparing multiple contemporaneous hoards, we can draw larger conclusions about how and where different types of coins circulated, and thus how people actually use their money. Sadly, however, the vast majority of hoards found on land and on the seafloor have not been properly excavated or recorded. Most have been recovered illegally or under circumstances that did not prioritize careful removal. Critical information has therefore been lost forever including where, in fact, coins were found and their exact contents. Now, shipwrecks are extraordinary phenomena, since a single wreck might contain dozens of separate hoards. The purses of individual passengers, for example, were likely to contain rather different coins depending on their socioeconomic status, their travels, their personal money preferences. At the same time, states or corporations or very wealthy individuals often shipped large amounts of various types of coins for various purposes. A state, for example, might have shipped coins of a single denomination from a single mint and a single year in one container, while an individual or corporation might have shipped coins of different denominations of mints, years, and even nationalities in another container. In order to differentiate all the various hoards contained within a single wreck, each and every coin must be carefully excavated and its precise location mapped and recorded. If coins are raised in large concretions, perhaps the remains of, a coin, of coins held in a chest, the concretion itself must then be carefully disassembled, 
with the location of individual coins within the concretion mapped and recorded. Such care gives us insight into how the hoard was assembled. Older coins on the bottom and newer coins on top might indicate a longer period of time for gathering the coins, for example, which could have significant historical ramifications. Once properly excavated, the real work on coins began. Most coins, whether excavated on land or in water, require some cleaning and conservation. For coins made of reactive metals like copper and silver, the conservation process can be intensive, requiring special conservators and equipment. And as the coins are being conserved, a detailed individualized database record needs to be created for each coin, including high quality photographs, basic measurements like weights and diameter, typological information like nationality, mint, denomination, and date, as well as notes on post-production modifications like graffiti, countermarks, cuts, clippings, and so forth. Once these basic tasks are completed, actual study of the coins can begin. Archaeologists, numismatists, and historians must therefore work in concert to situate the coins within various contexts, including the production context, the circulation context, and finally the event, whether shipwreck or war, or what have you, that buried them. The numismatic portion of the study might necessitate intensive comparative die studies. This is comparing individual coins to determine whether or not they were manufactured using the same set of dies. Um, or it might require um, non-destructive metallurgical analysis to determine what actual alloys were used in their manufacture. This larger project of scholarly synthesis must then be fully published and ideally in a peer-reviewed publication with each and every coin cataloged and illustrated, whether in print or online. And in fact, online catalogs now are a fantastic way to publish large amounts of coins. And finally, the disposition of the coins themselves then needs to be sorted. And this is something I'll get to in a moment. Now, what I've outlined here is an ideal scenario in which shipwreck coins are excavated, studied, and published to the absolute highest possible scientific standards. But these standards come at a cost. They are resource, time, and money intensive. And the, and, um, as an example, the excavation study of one of the largest land hoards found to date, the Fromm Hoard from England, containing some 50,000 coins, has required countless hours of specialist conservation, um, numismatic work, and a lot of money to complete. And in fact, full conservation of the coins still has not been completed for lack of funds. Now, as we all know, ships are enormous vehicles. The number of coins they are able to convey is absolutely staggering. To date, tons of coins, numbering in the hundreds of thousands, have been pulled from some wrecks. The utter magnitude of such coin finds puts them in a completely different register compared to finds on land, requiring exponentially greater resources, time, and money to deal with. This means that prior to any excavation, adequate financial resources and specialists need to be gathered for the proper recovery, conservation, study, and publication of the coins, tasks that could take many years, if not decades, to complete. To commit to anything less for each and every shipwrecked artifact, including each and every coin, is frankly irresponsible and borders on treasure hunting. Once the coins are fully and carefully published and the numismatists and archaeologists are, for the moment, done with them, their final disposition needs to be realistically considered. In an ideal world, national museums would have ample space and staff resources to display, store, and care for tons of newly excavated shipwrecked coins. The continued storage and availability of all the coins from a single wreck in one place could aid future research if problems with earlier research are noted or if new questions come to mind. In the real world, however, most national museums are poorly funded, understaffed, and have little space to spare. There will no doubt be temptations to sell coins, probably fueled by the absolutely erroneous belief that coins are repetitious and have little individually to offer to historical research. If nations cave to this temptation 
and one would hope doing so only with the stated intention of providing funding for their museums. Policies can then be devised for keeping the best preserved and most historically significant coins for the national collection, while releasing for sale only those coins that have been certified by numismatic experts as exact dye duplicates in poor condition. Now, I, I want to end by just stating that coins are not treasure. They are cultural heritage and need to be protected, preserved, and studied as such. Thank you.